This is our hope for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter in the church year and Communion Sunday here at Bethesda. If you are unable to be with us in person but are joining us online or on the radio, we hope that you will be blessed as we worship together as God's people and feel a part of the fellowship here. What a beautiful spring day. I mean, to gather together to worship, uh, to see the beautiful greenery and the warmth that we've been waiting for and the flowering shrubs and flowers. And I like, on top of it all, a full moon. Uh, the scriptures tell us that the sun, moon, and stars and the earth and everything in it and the sea and everything in it for their very existence, praise God for his creation, the creator of all things, God our Father. And so we begin our worship this morning with the reading of God's word, our call to worship, found in Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you, to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. These are God's words to us this morning. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, we give you praise with all of creation, that you are the creator of all that exists. We come with thankful hearts. We are awed that you would be mindful of us. May we be imitators of Christ, who although he was in very nature God, humbled himself as a servant and became obedient unto death even on a cross. May his name be exalted in our worship this morning. Bless all that is said and done. And we thank you by your grace for the invitation to us as sinners to the Lord's table. To thine be the glory. Amen. Well, let's come into God's presence with singing as we stand and sing together. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda. It's good to be with you this morning. As we enter May, being on staff, working with students, it's always a time for me to have a love-hate relationship with the month. I love that we have so many students graduating. And this morning, Pastor Kirk is going to be praying for them in just a moment. Our students graduating from high school and UWEC, as well as the Technical College. I'm excited for them as they move on to a next chapter in adventure in life, but I'm sad working in student ministry because for many of them, they will go away to college or they will move on to a career maybe in another city. So it's sort of my last month to have um, opportunity for personal relationship and some through the summer and fall as they move on to the next chapter. So in a moment, Pastor Kirk will be praying for um, our first responders as well as our graduates and encourage you to be praying for them through the month of May and what God has for them. We have three unique opportunities for community here at Bethesda moving into the next couple of weeks. First of this Friday is a field trip Friday for children's ministry. They will be going to a fire station this Friday. Registration for that is available online if you have a child and a parent who would like to participate in that. Also, VBS registration opens this Wednesday for children, so if you have children or grandchildren and you want to register for that, this Wednesday is the first opportunity. Registration to volunteer for VBS is open now, and you can go online and find a place to serve. There is an opportunity to serve for VBS this Wednesday. There's a VBS work party to prepare for VBS and some of the decorating that is from 4 to 7 this Wednesday for all ages to come. I know our middle school and high school students will be a part of that. I encourage anyone to join. It's sort of an open house, so you don't have to be there from 4 to 7, but anything in there that would work for you, a great time for community and help us get ready for VBS. I also want to let you know, next Sunday, Student Ministries is putting on an old-fashioned pancake feed, and they would like to serve you and feed you pancakes and sausage and cinnamon rolls. That will happen between the two services. So right after this service, I know all our life group, adult life groups are attending it, and we're all going to come together and just celebrate what God's doing in our midst and let students serve. So I invite you to that next Sunday morning. Good morning. I'm not up here often, uh, and I'm okay with that. Um, I'm Kurt Madison, the uh, lay pastor here. Um, I'm often asked, so what's a lay pastor? Uh, I guess the simple explanation is when the, when the pastor's here, Pastor uh, Kirk and Pastor Brian um, have duties or uh, tasks that they really don't want to do, they lay it on me. <laughs> so, th- thus... Thus, we have lay pastor. So, and if you want to see me after the service, I'll be out in the parking lot changing oil and washing their cars. So, okay. Um, I want you to think about your careers for a second here. Uh, past careers or your current career, or some of you graduates maybe thinking about future careers. I just got a few questions about that. How many of you routinely face video cameras on the job and then are publicly scrutinized on social media? How many of you had to complete a line of duty death packet in case you died on the job? How many of you were trained and expected to run into danger and mayhem while everyone else is running away? Uh, Is the suicide rate in your career nearly twice that of the general public? Uh, I've been a volunteer chaplain for the uh, police, fire, EMS, uh, Eau Claire and Altoona for about four or five years. I don't actually remember exactly when I started, but uh, I learned a lot about what first responders do, uh, the training, the daily challenges, the uncertainty, and the trauma they face on a regular basis. Uh, My duties vary. Um, Sometimes I get called at any hour to help uh, to serve a death notification. Um, I help with swearing in celebrations and memorial services, uh, and I assist with, I'm, I'm a member of the peer support and the crisis intervention teams here in Eau Claire as well. Uh, One of the toughest calls I received was about 9.30 p.m.
p.m. on uh, New Year's Eve 2020. Um, one of the officers in Eau Claire took his life. Did you know that uh, more first responders die of suicide than in the line of duty? Um, see if I can get that. I'm going to scroll through. These are some of our first responders here. I don't know if I got, found them all, but uh, um, here at uh, Bethesda. Uh, May is designated to honor and recognize our first responders, and I'd like to help us uh, recognize those people uh, today. I'll just scroll through these so you can just see who these recognized faces. Uh, so when you do see them here, um, you'll know who they are. I'm guessing some of you are going to see people and say, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize they did that. I think Grant's the only firefighter in this picture. As you can see, they've gone through uh, an extensive, and they continue to go through training uh, throughout their careers as things change. Um, if we have any first responders here, I know there's a couple. I actually know some of them are on duty today, this morning, so they won't be here. And if our graduates uh, that are here would stand up with our first responders, we'd like to, to pray for you. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, today we lift up those people who devote their lives to serve and protect your sheep, who choose to face the dangers and the evil that, rest, that the rest of us flee from. We ask for your hand of protection over them from emotional, spiritual, and physical trauma, and we ask your blessing on their families. Lord, we also lift up Damji and Musa, uh, who are seeking you, and I pray that they would continue to seek you and find you, and uh, that they would... Uh, make you their Lord and Savior. We also pray for our graduates, that they will continue to seek and serve you, that you'll direct their paths, help them discover the use of the gifts that you've given them, and walk alongside them as they pursue their goals. In your name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn uh, references the scripture we read earlier from Philippians. May the mind of Christ my Savior. Let's stand as we sing together.
please be seated. For the last seven years, each spring, <clears throat> I've given a series of messages entitled, We Don't Talk About, a series about a specific subject or topic in a gospel way. You could put that another way, called, Can We Talk About? So this morning, we take a break from our Hebrew series, and before we start our Summer in the Psalm series, for two weeks, we'll look at two different topics. Our message this morning is on unity or what I've entitled, The Final Apologetic or Defense of Our Faith. But before we begin, that this important matter matters, unity matters, let me preface three key points by framing the following comments. One, this message on unity is not a rebuke, but a re reminder of the importance of why unity matters. Not in a mushy, nothing matters in terms of biblical truth or Christian doctrine, but really an admonition that came from Jesus himself on the importance that unity has in a tangible way in a dying culture that they can see a supernatural healing and authentic hope amongst those who have been truly born again. This message is also a reminder that Jesus makes a difference in practical issues that we face today that can and could divide us as a church. One of the two most famous parables ever given is known as the Good Samaritan. It pushes the truth that as true followers of Jesus who are born again, once again, by a second time by the gift of the gospel, a new lens for life and all the challenging issues are to be seen through the gospel. Who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what Jesus does in those who are born again, and how it affects values and speech and thoughts and actions truly how we treat our neighbor, but also how we conduct ourselves as the bride of Christ. And finally, a reminder about this message is that no one has this unity perfected. To say unity matters and is the church's final apologetic is not a term that promotes sloppy love or who cares what we believe, nor does it justify prideful rhetoric and heart posture. Unity reminds us that Jesus' words cut two ways— the world will know you are my disciples and followers of me if you love one another. What happens if we infight and we judge and we use our tongues in a hurtful way and not grace one another? What is a dying culture seeing in a living church, a gospel-centered church like Bethesda? Service in humility? I pray so. Or is there another spirit? This is especially tender in this church that we call Bethesda. We are less than 24 months away from turning 100. That's worthy to be celebrated. Now, you'll hear more about our 100th anniversary in the months to come, but turning 100 gives you perspective. Pastors like me will come and go. Elders will serve and then pass on the baton of leadership to other elders. But a couple things happen and comes with age when you turn 100. Wisdom, hopefully. Grace, because love and grace eclipse all. And maybe one of the best things that older followers of Jesus have seen is that God is faithful. He keeps his word. And even in the midst of tension and possible division, there is a gospel way, a third way of dialogue and discourse. And having gospel conversations uses language like, help me understand. This is taking place in real time. Just last week, I was on a Zoom call with a high school teacher who said, Kids as young, and fr young as freshmen in high school are being pressed to come up with their opinion regarding Roe v. Wade as it overturned in the court. How would you counsel a freshman in high school if she were your niece or he was your nephew? And they hear the deluge of social media comments. This has caused disunity amongst members in the same family. What do you say? An article came across my desk this week that I forwarded on to Lindy Gardner. I said, can you read this? It's called God, Abortion, and Us. She read it, and she said, Kirk, this is a fantastic article. I want to pass it on to you. You can find it at the Welcome Center, or there's a link in your bulletin insert. How would you counsel a friend on another issue in real time? How would you counsel a friend who wrestles with the effects and the causes of COVID? I went to Quick Trip on Friday, and... USA Today, the front of USA Today said, COVID legacy, grief, anger, and frustration. 
and I read the article, and there's over a million deaths. Those are dads and grandmas, best friends and spouses, fiancés and sweet community folks, and the wake is still with us. How do we handle this hurt? Those who are cautious as followers of Christ, those who wear masks or don't wear masks. I've had to check my own spirit when I see that, and instead of asking the question, what's their problem, asking the question, I wonder what their story is. So let's dive into why unity matters. Unity matters, and we first want to take a look at a very messy church, and that messy church is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter, first, the entire book of 1 Corinthians. The key theme of 1 Corinthians is unity. The Bible Project has once again done a beautiful work on this, and you can pick up a paper copy of the Bible Project at the Welcome Center or download it. The link is there on your bulletin insert, or if you're watching online, you can do it that way. And what's interesting is that there's five different topics on unity that this young church disagreed about. Each topic still causes divisions and heartaches and tension in the church. So here's a real quick overview. Chapters 1 through 4 talk about leadership preferences. That was causing a division. It was Paul and Apollos, and they differed on styles and personalities. Do you think they did? Of course they did. But the Apostle Paul says, don't forget their primary topic of their ministry. It was Jesus. The next tension is in, found, found in chapters 5 through 7, and it's the subject of sex, sexual integrity, and sexual practices. Do you think that has caused any issues in the church? Wow. Paul reminds us that the body has been redeemed by Jesus for Jesus, and this beautiful gift of sexuality is to be reserved for a reflection of Christ and his bride, the church. The issue as a follower of Jesus is not, it's my own body, I, want it, I can do with it what I want, but my body and my spirit has been bought and redeemed by Jesus. And the gospel lens is for that time, and it applies for us. The third division that caused a lot of tensions then and still causes tensions now is personal preferences. My life, my choice in terms of what I do privately and publicly. But Paul pushes back. Because followers of Jesus were bought and legally declared forgiven, we are now adopted into God's family, and others are affected by our actions. Gospel lens here means don't cause another to stumble or to trip up or write off the whole gospel because of your freedoms. You aren't your own to do what you want as a follower of Christ. I know that's very anti-American and anti counterculture but daughter of the king, son of the Most High, our first allegiance is to King Jesus. He calls me to love not just my neighbors, but the hard part, my enemies too. Chapters 12 through 4, I know I'm going through this quickly, but bear with me. Chapters 12 through 4 talk about church gatherings. Think about how many fights and departures and disagreements have taken place about church gatherings. Worship styles, worship musics, length of sermons, times of services. But worship gatherings, it issues discussed here were the use of spiritual gifts in the beautiful description of the body of Christ. How does each gift play their part of the rescue drama of salvation? How are singles and divorced, married and widowers, young families and teenagers, young adult and empty nesters, how do they use their gifts in serving one another? Here the gospel lens gives us a caution not to split the beautiful garment in 1 Corinthians 12, 25. All our gifts, gifts are not to divide. Let that not happen. The gospel witness is at stake. Paul concludes the final tension in this very messy church about doctrine. The doctrine is even at risk. If in chapters 12 through 4, this has, these, these, these gifts have split the church, but without this doctrine in chapter 15, there is no church. The gospel is at stake. Truly, a stake is drilled down. Doctrine, theology, truth matters. And that doctrine is ultimately about the resurrection of Jesus. Without this doctrine, our faith is anchorless. We would sing songs. My friend Tim would sing songs. Wouldn't this be ridiculous about singing about a nice, dead, former religious teacher who lived 2,000 years ago? That's not what we sing about. The resurrection did happen. That's the hope that we're built for another life. Good people don't go to heaven, friends. Forgiven people do. 
You see, the gospel is the announcement that Jesus gives a new reality. 1 Corinthians 15 is the rock-solid defense of the resurrection. Often cited during Easter sermon, it ends with a call, a reminder, a declaration after 57 verses of truth. Two, therefore, sisters and brothers, don't let anyone move you off the foundation of your faith. Always excel in the work of the Lord. You know that the hard work you do for the Lord is not pointless. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. This is a good chance to pause. Many have heard ser sermons or stories of unity and the process of it, and unity means ecumenical or maybe a lack of a strong backbone that will stand up to suffering, death, difficulties, and persecution. So what are the non-negotiables, that pillars that won't change that we should hold on to? Well, I'm going to oversimplify this, but you can start with the four solas, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, the word alone. And our Reformed friends would want to add one more to the glory of God alone. We'll let that one in too. The Apostles' Creed is also another place to hold on to. I have ministered and interacted with students for 40 years. Since beginning my freshman year working in, with Young Life in Washington State, this has been something that I've told students as they've left and graduated. Find a church that teaches from the Bible, make, that makes Jesus the center of the preaching, and a place that you can use your gifts and grow with others your age. Denomination is secondary. I need to say that because there's no Lutheran Brethren Church in Atlanta or Whitefish, Montana. About a month ago, there was a young man that met me out in the foyer. He was on his way from New York to Whitefish, Montana. His name is Jordan. He said, Pastor Kirk, I just want to give you a quick hug on my way. Maybe you saw his truck with a big old trailer. I said, can I get you a cup of coffee? And we had a cup of coffee. And I looked at Jordan and I said, have you found a church yet? He goes, oh yeah, I found a church, Kirk. And we prayed together. People hunger for unity. History proves that. At the end of World War II, when Germany was divided between East and West Germany, there was a wall that went up between East and West Germany. And when that wall came down, celebrating Germany was reunited. The world took notice. And it took notice when it said this. This is the Star and Trib on November 10th. East Germany opens its borders. My mom and dad were in Germany shortly thereafter, and they got us a piece of the Berlin Wall right there. People hunger for unity. Let me remind you of what we just looked at in a very messy church. These five topics, church leadership, sexuality, personal private preferences, worship gatherings, doctrinal truths, they still matter. And aren't you glad the Apostle Paul addressed these here and said, in a sense, the gospel truth, the person and work of Jesus is smack dab in the middle. What a great reminder when it comes to unity. Amen? Yeah. Unity matters. There's a picture, by the way. Unity matters, but unity is never alone. Holiness is wedded alongside it. I invite you to open up a Bible, a pew Bible, and I'm going to just walk you through a couple verses real quick. Philippians, the book of Philippians, page 1011, if you want to find it. There's an interesting word found in Philippians chapter 127, page 1011. Find verse 27. It says this, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The word conduct yourself is the word politheia. Thea. Hear that word? It le literally means this. Live as good citizens in the manner worthy of the gospel of the Messiah. Live as good citizens worthy of the gospel of the Messiah. Unity alone turns a blind eye to people's behavior or core beliefs. It doesn't matter what you believe is some ideas. Here you throw out doctrinal truth. And many of us have seen that happen in Protestantism, sadly, in our lifetimes. But listen, friends, biblical diversity need not be disunity. Julie and I have been so fortunate as a couple to meet beautiful believers in Chad, Africa, 
in the jungles of Ecuador. I personally met beautiful believers in the coffee shops of Scotland, and my wife, before we met, met believers in the slums of India under the ministry of Mother Teresa. We could go on and on. The week before the pandemic, Pastor Brian and I attended a three-day conference in Washington, D.C. It was hosted at an all-black church in conjunction with the respected reform ministry called Gospel Coalition. For three days, I heard biblical preaching from a wide range of pastors, some that you would recognize and others you wouldn't. It was called Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim's Politics, excuse me. As a, yeah, that would have been great, huh? You're that old? No, I'm not that old. <laughs> As my black brothers preached, I realized that my grandparents were never lynched. My little grandkids were never told you can't drink from that water fountain or play at that park, and my heart was wrenched. Let us understand that not all those who call themselves Christians are born again. That is the bottom line, a very sombering situation in Matthew 25. But let Jesus sort people out. He has the right and the authority, not me or you. Holiness needs to be wedded with unity. Be of the same mind. Did you catch that when our friend Tim read the scriptures? Flip over, over the page to page 1012. Do you see the four ifs? If you have your Bible, you can circle, circle if. Tim said the word if four different times. Be of the same mind. A fragmented church doesn't have much of a witness. So be careful. Often what follows is a rigorous standard and splits off from anyone one might disagree with. You aren't in my camp, so you're out. And ugliness pops its head out with words and actions and attitudes. Often people will gather to pray and gossip. We talk about what's wrong for 10 minutes. Let us be on our knees and pray for healing for 20 minutes. Finally, in the book of Philippians, we see this. We are to let our gentleness, gentleness be evident to all. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The gospel is the transforming power of Jesus. It is the transforming power of Jesus that affects our hearts, our thoughts, our speeches, and our actions that is beyond one's own resources. What's really interesting is in front of these verses, verse 5, is verses 2. Take a look at what happens in verse 2. Scholars don't know what happened. I plead with Eudea and I plead with Sinite to be of the same mind in the Lord. There was tension there. And the antidote is be of the same mind. Commandments 3 and 4 use this word, honor. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your mother and father. Each month, our pastors and ministry directors are asked to give a one-page summary of their month's activities to our elder board. We call these our ministry reports. The intent of the ministry report is to update and give the overseers, the elders of our church, a brief overview. And we ask the staff to give four things that they're working on or projects and three prayer requests for their ministry or for themselves. And then our elders pray for those prayer requests each month. Let me tell you what three of my prayer requests are. And the guys see this each month. Two of them have to do with gospel partnerships that we support in our community. And I may have shared this before, but here's my number one prayer request for our church that I pray for and I ask our elders to pray for. It's this. Pray that God will protect our church's, church family's sweet unity from division and gossip. Pray for the health of our church family. Pray that reconciliation would take place where it needs to amongst those in our church family. Pray that a spirit of repentance and pettiness be confessed. Tribalism and preferences will be identified and laid at the cross. Pray against spiritual pride. Pray, too, that legalism will be toned down as a stronghold. Pray that the enemy of our souls would be browned. And pray earnestly, oh, please pray earnestly, that a toxic and critical and disobedient spirit that leaks against the bride of Christ would be confessed. Let me, under, let me just review this second point really clearly. Holiness and unity are wedded together, and because of the gospel, they complement each other. One author put it this way, 
if we stress the love of God without the holiness of God, it turns out to be compromise. But if we stress the holiness of God without the love of God, we practice something that is hard and lacks beauty. I'm not sure about you, but I want to look like Jesus in my body and my voice. I want him to use his personality. I want him to use my personality and what he's given to me to be his reflection. I want to be a reflection of, of his. So this has been a hard message, hard message that I've worked on for three months. So let's just relax for just a minute and blow off a little steam and laugh. I say that because I've been influenced by G.K. Chesterton, a British lay theologian who said this, humor can get under the door while seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. So get ready to laugh. There's a point to this. Have you heard this before? Dog owners, owners who look like dogs. Now my grandkids are here and we have a Shih Tzu and I don't think I look like my Shih Tzu, but you might think I like this because he's a pastor. The second one, um, that is great hair. But this is my third one. I just love this one right here. I love that guy. He would be so great as an usher here at the church. I want to look like Jesus. And so I've shown this video to students at Bible camp for a number of years. You're going to meet an actor who looks like Jesus. And I really think that when Jesus watches this video, he laughs, but then he groans. But there's a subtle twist at the end because Christ lives in you. It's just a short video. It's called Jesus Wouldn't Do That. I think it makes a pretty clear point. Can you turn it up a little bit? Guys, check it out, right? Parents are out of town. Yeah. Party at my place. You. <laughs> what about the new kid? The new kid. Yeah, let me go ahead and check that list real quick. Sorry, bro. <laughs> Not on the list, man. All right, man. I know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not my father's house. <laughs> You can't sit here. There's no room. Beat it, Judas. <laughs> Who put pork on my pizza? <laughs> Watch close. Hey guys, this is Justin. This is his first time to our youth group. Want to make you feel a little welcome? Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. Wow, Jesus wouldn't act that way, would he? Jesus is in us. So here's my final point. Unity, can you pull up the next slide? Unity is the church's final apologetic. I'm sorry. Unity is the church's final apologetic. A hurting world is watching. This passage of scripture is for present disciples who Jesus was talking to, but he was also talking about future disciples in John 17, 20 through 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us, and so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love me even as that you have sent me and love them even as you have loved me. The gospel because of Jesus changes sinners into a community of grateful family members. Churches become spiritual hospitals where good news is proclaimed. Sin is confessed and broken. Grace is declared and hope is reminded. Let us as older Christians set the model for graciousness and gentleness. Weep and intercede on your knees, knees for neighbors and friends who you might disagree with. Confess your disdain or even lack of love to our Lord privately. He cares about that. He sees that. Ask this question that I've had to ask in wrestling with this message to share with you. Lord, am I a spiritually smug person? I'm a beggar who got into the kingdom of God. 
because of Jesus, and so are you. Let our first allegiance be with Jesus. To younger believers who may be watching this online, listening, or here today, please don't let the messy saints and negative narratives take away that you see in the headlines, take away from the 10,000 and 10,000 of infectious, beautiful saints, tons of who are not famous, who are unknown, who are followers of Jesus, who are simply walking in humility and obedience. My final class in my undergraduate work was a two-credit self-directed study on the works of Francis Schaeffer. I was two credits short, so I did a self-directed study class on Francis Schaeffer. I didn't read all of these. I read most of them. And in volume four of his work, if you don't know who Francis Schaeffer was, he was a Christian author, Christian thinker, and he really introduced the idea of biblical worldview and the lens that we have to many, to really to the body of Christ. He popularized it. But in one of his books called The Mark of a Christian, he has something very powerful for us to recognize and wrestle with. And I'd invite you, if you have a bulletin insert, to flip it on the back side. We're just going to read it quickly as we wrap this message up. The Mark of the Christian. Jesus turns to the world and says, I have something to say to you. On the basis of my authority, I give you a right. You may judge whether or not an individual is a Christian on the basis of the love he shows to all Christians. In other words, if people come up to us and cast in our teeth the judgment that we are not Christians because we have not shown the love toward other Christians, we must understand they are only exercising a prerogative which Jesus gave. And we must not be angry. If people say, you don't love other Christians, we must go home, get down on our knees, and ask God whether or not what they say is true. And if it is then, they have the right to have said what they said. We must be careful at this point, however. We may be a true Christians, really born-again Christians, and yet fail in our love toward other Christians. Jesus here in John 17 makes a very careful distinction between those who have cast themselves upon him in faith and those who stand in rebellion. Hence, in John 17, 21, when he prays for oneness, the they he is referring to are true Christians. Notice, however, that verse 21 says that they may be one, The emphasis is interesting enough. It's the same as in John 13. Not those in certain parties of the church should be one, but that all born-again Christians should be one. Now comes the sobering part. Jesus goes on in John 17, 21 to say something that always causes me to cringe. If as Christians we do not cringe, it seems that we're not very sensitive or very honest because Jesus gives us the final apologetic. What is the final apologetic? That they may be one as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is the final apologetic. In John 13, the point was that if an individual Christian does not show love towards other Christians, the world has a right to judge that that person is not a Christian. Wow. Here in John 17, 21, Jesus is stating something else, which is much more cutting, much more profound. We can expect the world to believe that the Father sent the Son, Jesus' claims are true and that Christianity is true unless the world sees some reality of the oneness of true Christians. Now that is frightening. Should we not feel some emotion at this point? But we cannot expect the world to judge that way because the world cares nothing about doctrine. That is especially true in the second half of the 20th century when on the basis of their epistemology, which is understanding what is true, people no longer believe even in the possibility of absolute truth. And if we're surrounded by a world which no longer believes in the concept of truth, certainly we cannot expect people to have any interest whether a person's doctrine is correct or not. But Jesus did give the mark that will arrest the attention of the world, even the attention of the person who says we are just machines. Because everyone is made in the image of God and therefore has aspirations for love, there's something that can be very, there can be something that can be in every geographic climate, in every point of time, which cannot fail to arrest one's attention. What is that? The love that true Christians show for each other and not just for their own party. We are messy sinners. We are in a war. You and I are fighting the everyday beast of sin within us and the devil hates us. And the values that we hold to our counterculture as long as we live in the flesh. 
Our secret weapon is daily repentance. It's the intake of God's word. It's the taking of the sacraments. It's being with God's people on a regular basis. All those are given to help us and equip us to battle the enemy for one more day. Let the cross offend. Those who are born again know this truth, that Jesus died not to make bad people good, but dead people to be alive. Remind yourself of what the cross symbolizes. This is a hospital for sinners. Our disease, God protect us from our disease of smugness. Let me end with a quote and end with this illustration before we prepare our hearts for communion. Romans chapter 7, verse 4 in the King James has a unique way of framing our relationship with Jesus. It says this, Therefore, my fellow friends, my brethren, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be, listen to this word, married to one another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Other versions use the word united or belong, but I like that word married. I've used this illustration before of a young bride who was, I think, stunning on her wedding day. It was 1956, and that was my mom on her wedding day. And my mom eventually passed away from uh, cognitive impairment, dementia. And it, part of one of the parts of our journey is that my mom burned their house down in 2009. And I had the responsibility as their son to go through all of their stuff. They kept all of the smoke damage stuff. And one of the things that I kept is uh, something that I keep in my garage. And that's her wedding dress. And I keep it for a number of reasons. One, sentimental. But I love what it represents. We're the body of Christ. We're soiled. We're sinful. We're messy. We got smudges and marks. And we look like this, maybe to one another. Obviously, Christ sees us as pure and spotless and white. But to one another, this is what we are. Messy sinners. Trying to follow Jesus. Often failing more times than we have wins but we stand in light of the cross. Nobody deserves this meal, friends. This is the admission that we need Jesus every day to battle sin and the beast within us. Amen? Amen. Intentionally, communion has followed the preaching of the word so that in the preaching of the word, we hear the word of God. We are convicted by our sin. We say, God, have mercy. And when we say God has mercy, he hears. So I invite you now just to close your eyes, confess your sin, turn and repent, ask God for mercy. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Here is the story of our Lord's suffering and death for us is given to us in the Holy Scriptures. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminal, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. And the soldiers came up and mocked him, and they offered him wine and vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hurled their, hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God, since you're under the same sentence. We're punished justly for we're getting what, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. 
and a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant, and they lifted it to the lips of Jesus. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And this wonderful promise that you just experienced, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So before we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, I ask you these questions. Do you believe in the promises found in the Bible? And do you recognize Jesus' beautiful presence here? Do you repent of your sin? And if you have, with due diligence, sought reconciliation with fellow believers in our church? I'd invite you to stand at this time. For 2,000 years, the Christian church has confessed their words in the Apostles' Creed. I made reference to this in my message. This unites us. Let's confess together. Do you want to pull that up? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Please have a seat. Just a few things about communion here. If you're a guest or if you're a visitor, you love Jesus Christ and know him as your Savior and Lord, this meal is for you. This is for broken people. We ask that you would come up. Um, there is a blessing there for uh, little children to take. There are gluten-free wafers at each of the stations. There's two in the back, two here. We'd ask that you'd go take a cup if you want to take it for someone else who's not able to come up. That's fine. You can do that as well. And then go back to your seat, and we'll all take communion together. This is our Father's table. It's for us, messy people. Aren't you glad? That's why they call it good news. Amen. So 
what we share in this bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of love around the table of the King. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember, he drained death's cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. So we share in this bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace around the table of the King. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as the body here on earth. As we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of the King. Welcome to the King's Table. I invite you to open up the top layer Pull that back. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat it. Now pull back that foil that's there. Do you have that? This is the blood of the crucified, ridden Lord. Take and drink. Hear these words, our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now given you his holy body and blood by which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, grant by your word and the power of your Holy Spirit that as we have received your body and blood, we may be assured again, once again, of the forgiveness of all our sins and be strengthened by your presence. We humbly receive the full benefits of this sacrament, and we offer you our spiritual sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and receive the benediction. I want to let you know of a couple things that are happening, my friend Tim, if you want to sneak out at this time. As we do for each communion Sunday, we offer the anointing with oil. There's this beautiful promise that's found in James chapter 5. Is anyone sick? Is anyone in need of healing? And call the elders together. Pray over them. Confess your sins. That anointing with oil is by our church offices. If you don't know where that is, that would be in your back right there. And look for the signs. Tim, who led, and Pastor Kurt will be there. They'd be delighted to do that. Also today at 4 o'clock, my friend Karen is going to be leading a hymn sing at 4 o'clock. It's going to be a wonderful time. 
And if that's of interest to you, you're invited to come, invite a friend, and uh, we'll have a chance to sing some songs in worship and praise at 4 o'clock today. And then next week, we'll do another special message entitled, Can We Talk About Mental Health? My friend Becca Larson, Becky, can you just wave your hand? There she is right there. She's a school counselor. She and I are going to do a dialogue message, and I think that you're going to lo be looking forward to this. We hear lots about that, but especially how do believers wrestle with that? And that's something that Becky and I are going to uh, share with you. I'm looking forward to sharing that message with you next week. Receive the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his wonderful supernatural peace. In the name of the Father who loves you so much and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's given his body and blood. And the Holy Spirit, the one who transforms us to love one another. Amen.